needs to do, every church needs to keep on shifting uh, to stay in line with what the scriptures are saying. The reason why that's needed is because we always have new people coming and joining us. We're in all different places in our journey and our understanding of the Word of God, and we're always changing. And so there needs to be a reminder of things past. Just because something was happening 30 years ago doesn't mean it has to be happening today. But we do need to be in line with God's Word. And what happens with churches is what we call missional shift. The mission of the church, we get a little bit off course and we need to make a, a course correction. Just like you are if you're sailing across the ocean. The winds may blow you or the, the waves may get you a little bit off course and you need to make a course correction. That's what this series is about. And, uh, as we go through the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. Today, a little shift in our understanding of divine healing. I do not believe in faith healing. I don't believe faith heals anybody. I believe, even though the scriptures use that word, you were healed by your faith. But it's not just faith, but it's where is your faith placed? Faith is hanging all your trust on something. You hang all your trust on Jesus Christ and your faith will make you whole. See, it's divine healing. God must provide the healing. The person that is speaking to you doesn't bring the healing. The, the evangelist doesn't bring the healing. The pastor doesn't bring the healing. The person that is praying over you is not the source of the power of your healing. But we are accessing this wonderful opportunity and this gift that God presents to us that in his will we can be healed physically emotionally spiritually we can be healed mentally I know some of you have been hanging out with me over the last few weeks you think I need a healing in my mental um, I've been a little crazy today I was described as what uh, playful yeah so she she said look out pastor is being playful today. In other words, practical jokes and all that kind of stuff. So be careful. But I'm not going to do any now because I'm taking this seriously. We have this wonderful opportunity to access this divine presence of God. And with faith, once again, bring to him our weakness, our bodies which are broken down our situations in our lives, the things that weigh on our minds and cause us to have difficulty to sleep at night. I don't know about you, but when I have troubles and conflicts in my life, my chest feels like I'm about to have a heart attack. I've had to learn that one's not a heart attack. This one, this is trouble, you know, because we are affected by the things that happen in this world. And we need to make a shift. We need to once again believe in our God. Amen? You believe in Jesus Christ, don't you? You believe in his words? Well, let's look at what his church did in the book of Acts that causes us to have access to this divine healing. So my first scripture today is found in Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 42. And this is something we've read many times. We may not get away from this scripture for the entire series because this is a key scripture that I want to read to you. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47, and it says, and they devoted, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by those or I'm sorry done through the, the, the apostles and all who believed were together and had all things in common and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need and day by day attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer right now. Heavenly Father, as we prepare ourselves to be those who fulfill Scripture, as we look back at what many call this primitive church, the beginning of the church, as we endeavor to shift 
not just as an organization, but as, as a group of people, family, friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, as we as individuals shift to come in line with the acts of the apostles in the early church, we pray that, Lord, your Holy Spirit would be strong in us, that you give us boldness and courage, that, Lord God, that you would allow our eyes to see the miracle of people coming to know you as Savior, that, Lord, that you would give us the privilege of seeing people accept their gift that you have given to fulfill the purpose in their lives, that you would help us, Lord, as a church, have the privilege and experience the privilege of being truly united. Family, friends, brothers, sisters, whichever way we want to look at it, and that we would be a city on a hill that cannot be hidden, that the community around us would be dramatically affected by the shift that is happening in this little church. And I pray that you would do this for your glory. And we thank you today for allowing us to share in some of that glory as your co-laborers. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. So, healing begins with this. When we do our best to meet the needs of our church and our community. The, the outpouring of God's healing upon the church or a community begins when the church family, the body of Christ, begins to be very concerned about each other and concerned about what's going on in our community. In our church, we have a great concern for these things. Our concern for what is happening in people's lives in our church and in our community are the source of great conversations and great uh, debates even of how can we do this and how can we do that. And the reason why it's the source of that is because it is at the core of Jesus' heart that this would be the priority in our hearts as well. That we would not only love God, but that we would love one another. That we would even, as the scriptures say, love our, our enemies. And love our neighbors. If we, we spoke a couple of days ago about being a family. Well, for a family, then our family has a neighbor. And our family is not part of the church. I mean, our neighbor is not part of the church. So let's be those who love those who are not part of the church. This is at the core of God's heart. And there is always a healthy tension between what we desire and what we have done. That tension should be, as our overseer said yesterday in our, our um, uh, minister's meeting, that this tension should be something that stretches us. And then in its, in its strength of its tension being, uh, being maximized, it pulls from the other side. So our tension between what we desire in our hearts, what God desires, and what we are actually doing at this time there needs to be a tension, a continuous dragging, a pulling, a, a, a stretching of who we are. And this does not diminish what we were and what we have done, the amazing things that this church has done for our community. Just what we've done this last week is enormous when you compare it to another church. But see, we're not doing that. We don't want to compare ourselves to another church. We can never be comfortable that we did a little bit more than another church our size. Because then that limits God to the size of our church. And I know my God is much bigger than that. And when we limit, when we limit God to a particular size, that this is what God does in this size church, and this is what God does in that size church, and this is what God does in this kind of faithful church, and this kind of church doctrine, and this is what God does here, and this is what God does there. When we do that, we then introduce into our psyche limitations upon what God will do, and it limits what God does and the signs and wonders like healing our bodies. Because our God may not be big enough in this church. We might have to go to another church for that big God. 
So don't limit what we do in comparison to other churches our size or churches bigger than us. Do not compare yourself. There's one church, amen? There's one faith, one baptism. There's one Holy Spirit that gives gifts to all, amen? And we're part of that. But allow the tension to be there. Don't become disgruntled if the part that's being pulled doesn't move quick enough. But at the same time, don't become comfortable and not allow stretching. We need it. If we don't have it, then I think we're dying. Now, I'm not supposed to call myself old, but I know this about old people. I have all these rules on me now. But old people, I don't know anything about this, but what they told me. It's this, your skin stops stretching, <laughs> coming back. It's stretched out, and then that's it. And it doesn't snap back. And so what happens is everything is stretching, but nothing ever catches up. <laughs> nothing stretches back. So that that's, explains a lot. So anyway, <laughs> if we're a church that only stretches and becomes comfortable with the stretch without action, that will become like a saggy <laughs> lump of skin on a bunch of bones. But that's not what Christ has made us to be. Christ has made the body of Christ to be stretched, respond, and stretch, and respond, and stretch, and respond throughout eternity until we become that bride of Christ that he will present to all of the friends of the bridegroom that is without spot, blemish, and wrinkles. Amen. The older I get, and I'm not old yet. <laughs> but the older I get, the more I appreciate that scripture. <laughs> so we need to be stretched. This morning, we're doing a little bit of stretching. It's something that we've done before. But I want to just testify to you about what your church is doing. Thousands of dollars of benevolence giving has been given to people so that they can have heat, that they can have repairs, and that they could be able to meet their responsibility for rent. And all of these were people who were tested to make sure that they were not stealing from the church, but people who were actually in need. And that's just in the last month. Another thing that has happened is that there's this wonderful school up the road, Greenview Knowles Elementary School, with these incredible teachers that work there, and administrators, and counselors. And that church over there, or that, that, that school over there, we'll make it to church one day. But that school over there, <laughs> that school over there is glorifying our Father in heaven because of your good works. Let me tell you what can happen when we stretch. That school over there knows without doubting, without doubting our God, the God that this church serves, that no teacher will have to buy any supplies for the rest of this year at all. Now remove that one little piece of stress off of a teacher, that one complaint. Let me tell you, you know how stress and complaining makes you feel. Nobody wants to complain. Well, most people don't want to complain. And it's very, a lot of tension has to be created before they mention something. And when that tension is released, you feel so good, don't you? Well, there's a tension that teachers feel, and that is this, this idea that they are not supplied what they need, and that people don't always have the ability to bring it in. And so we have children that are under-resourced, are now under-resourcing the classroom, and now the teacher who is under-resourced from the government now has to purchase these things themselves. But not this school, because of this church, and because of the mighty God who has stretched us to meet the needs of that church, that school. Let me tell you what I envision in my eyes, that no elementary school in our vicinity will ever have to buy those things someday in the future because this church with this mighty God will always meet those needs for all of those, church, those schools. That's what I think. And I would love for us to be able to grow into such a kind of body that can meet the needs of the middle schools and the high schools and that they would glorify God for us doing things that we don't expect anything back from them. We don't expect special access 
We don't expect anything from them except for one thing, that they would thank our Father in heaven for anything that they have received. Amen? And I think above and beyond the, the, uh, the uh, pencils and the markers and the papers and the, and the headphones and all the other things that they were lacking, I think they liked the Keurig cup uh, coffee that we bought them. And uh, I think they're rejoicing over that the most. I know if I was a teacher, I would be. I know the teachers in our church, and they, they're addicted to coffee. Maybe they'll be healed today. All right. So healing begins when we do our best to meet the needs of our church and our community. And I can tell just by this conversation and the look on your faces that you agree with that. And I think that we can do that. I think that we've done a wonderful job, but I think that there's more that God wants us to do. That not only have we been adequate, but that it becomes such a sign and wonder to ourselves and the community around us and how God has used each one of us in our gifts to meet the needs of one another in our community. I think that we have such a distance to cover, nothing to feel ashamed of, but everything to look forward to, amen? And so today, what I'd like us to do, if the ushers would help me, I would like the ushers to take the, the offering baskets and put them here in front of the pulpit. And I would like you to prepare to bring your, your gift of shoes and coats and socks and everything else that you may have brought today. And I would like you in just a moment to bring those to the altars and present them to God. Then we're going to... The other thing that I'm going to do as the pastor of your church, I have the ability to uh, make a $500 um, change to the budget. I'm going to do that this morning. I want to make a $500 change by taking at least $500 of the cash offering today and giving that to the, uh, the home for a group of boys at the Church God Orphanage in Tennessee. Our state is responsible for one of those homes. And over the past decade, for one reason or the other, that home was neglected. It's in serious disrepair. The furniture is broken. Their TV is ancient. It's just been something that wasn't thought about very much, and it's gone into disrepair. About $12,000 of disrepair. And our state is going to be, our region is going to be rising to the occasion to meet that need. This morning, I'd like to take the authority vested in me by the Church of God and you to make sure that at least $500 of that goes to that home for the, for the orphans. Now, if the, the council would allow me to do more, that would be awesome. But that's up to them. If it's any more than their restrictions on them, then, of course, we'd have to have a church business meeting. So anyway, today, what I'd like us to do is take the undesignated cash offering and to give that to that uh, house for those boys in that orphanage. Um, in our church, we've always had a great heart for the orphan, for those who are being abused and needed to be put into our government system. Many families in our church are foster parents and have adopted children proclaiming the love of Jesus Christ to the world around us by doing so. Now, those people are called to do that. Not all of us are. But in this offering, we have an opportunity to join with that kind of heart and to support that, boy, that house full of boys uh, in Cleveland, Tennessee. Or actually, it's in Sevierville, I believe. So we're going to be doing that. So if the ushers could bring up the the baskets for the offering. We're going to all come together and we're going to present our shoes uh, to, uh, to the local food uh, or to the local uh, clothing closets and ministries and we're going to be giving our offering here today. The, um, the work that our church does, and I wanted to make sure I mentioned this too, not only does our church do th some things that we organize, but our members of our church, our brothers and sisters, our families, they do everything from deliver meals um, with Meals on Wheels. They are on the board of the mission and the uh, opportunity that this community has to meet the needs of the homeless in our community. They're on the board 
of the Pregnancy Care Center, which is helping young ladies and young men to be able to cope with something that they thought maybe there was only one answer to, and that was to have an abortion. But through the help of that center and the people on the board that attend our church, they're able to meet their needs in such a way that they have that wonderful gift of that child and they have the training and they have the education and they have some of the means to care for that child. And so there are many things being done in our church that I haven't mentioned that you do. And I want to thank you for that. And I want us to increase as a family of God and be stretched in our, 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 our effort to bring healing through what we can do in our community as God gives us the supply. So right now I'd like to release you to come forward and present your gifts to the Lord and to our community. Amen. Amen. God bless. God bless you. Amen. So the book of Acts, as I continue, the book of Acts is basically broken up into six sections. And each one of the sections takes us uh, a step further from Jerusalem to Rome, where Paul was eventually tried uh, for his crime of sharing his faith. And um, as th th we go through this, we see a fulfillment of the promises of God that we found in Acts chapter 1, 8, that he would pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And the spirit of God ministers, starting in Jerusalem and moves to Judea, Samaria, and among the Gentiles, then to Asia, Europe, and finally to Rome. And it is a story of the people of God empowered by the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's what the book of Acts is. The Acts of the Apostles is actually better titled the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the church. And so Luke, the writer of the book of Acts, is what you might call the theologian of the Holy Spirit. Him, along with Paul, really give us what we understand about the gifts of the Spirit and what the gifts of the Spirit do in the church. So the gift of the Holy Spirit has been poured out upon the church. Are you part of the church? Yeah? Are you part of the church? Yeah. Amen. All right. So the Holy Spirit's been poured out on you. It means the gifts of the Spirit are there as well. One of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is that we pray for one another and we are healed. Now, there are four times in the book of Acts alone where people were not healed. So the ministry of the Holy Spirit to heal is not that every single person, every single time is going to be healed of everything. I can pray about growing older. I'm not old yet. But as I'm growing older, I can pray about that and be healed from my old age, but that won't be answered. I will grow old. So as we experience the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the church, the gift of healing is among us. Not necessarily with the pastor, not necessarily with an elder, not necessarily with a teacher, but in all of us, somebody is called for a special gift of the Holy Spirit where they pray for the sick and God heals them. I believe that those people that receive that gift become incredibly humble people or else the gift is taken away. As soon as it becomes about them being the healers and people going strictly to them instead of God for healing, I believe that God's no longer in it. So I believe that those who have gifts of the Holy Spirit become humble and remain those who God can heal or use by being humble. And so today, don't be afraid to seek the gifts of the Holy Spirit just do this one thing or two things. Believe and stay humble. Remain humble so that God can continue to use us. Use you because we need you. We need somebody to speak in tongues and somebody to interpret. We need somebody who will pray, or pray with the intercessory prayer and to be uh, praying in the Spirit. We need people who will uh, be able to pray and miracles happen. We need people who pray and and people will be healed. We need people who have the special gift of generosity and we're able to answer the call when needs arise. We need those who have the gift of faith who when everyone else begins to lose their faith, 
Like I began to lose faith that we would ever find a piece of property. Right here, Tom Tenna had the gift of faith and wouldn't let me lay it down. And kept bringing more and more pieces of property to me so that I would be able to, to look into it. And I had given up until they, Tyrone and, and, and uh, Tom Tenna had brought to me another piece of property and we ended up owning that for one quarter of what we thought it would cost. And so that somebody has to have the gift of faith in our church. Seek these gifts. Don't be afraid of healing. Why would somebody be afraid of healing? For some reason, the devil has entered into our culture. The idea of false hope is dangerous. False hope is dangerous. Well, if you place your hope in things that cannot provide, then it might be dangerous. You'll get fooled in the end. But if you place your hope in God, who is more than able to provide every one of your needs, then how could it be false hope? So if your faith is in a healer, a person, then you may have false hope. But if your faith is in God, your hope cannot be false. So some people resist the idea of healings and being healed because they're afraid that they'll have a false hope and for some reason that would devastate their life. That somehow you would lose your faith in God because you weren't healed. The whole approach is not biblical when we think in that way. What, the way we should be approaching this is this. That if I never ask, then I guarantee I will never receive. But if I will ask with faith, then most of the time, I believe most of the time. Now, maybe I'm a guy with a gift of faith, or you may think I'm overly optimistic. But I believe that God's normal operation is to heal us and glorify His Son, God, uh, Jesus Christ in heaven, or to allow us to remain in our affirmity so that we may glorify God despite of it. But I believe what he wants to do is to heal us because he loves us. He wants to take care of us. He wants to give us every gift that we can handle without becoming spoiled. And I believe that healing is something God wants to do in us, especially if we continue to be stretched to meet the needs that we can in our community through the things he provides us, then also he wants to add to that his marvelous works, amen? I believe he wants to heal us so that there is that flash I talked about last week that draws people's attention so that we might be living epistles and share our word, our, our testimonies, the things that God has done in our lives with them. So healings in the, in the book of Acts, there's several, but here's a few examples. The lame man in chapter 3-1, which I'm going to read about. The result was 5,000 men became followers of Christ. Then we have... Uh, sick and unclean spirits in, in chapter 5 verse 16 and those people were healed and healed and healed and healed um, then we have uh, Aeneas in, or Aeneas in uh, chapter 9 verse 32 and what happened there was that Lydia and Sharon turned to the Lord when they saw that God healed and heard the message of Jesus Christ then we have the lame man in Listeria. Lystra, I'm sorry. In Lystra. He made a great number of disciples in Lystra after this enormous healing. So let's look at Acts chapter 3 1. That these incredible signs and wonders that happened there, the incredible signs and wonders that you hear us talk about that happened through prayer as we prayed for babies with tumors, ushers with tumors, people that had HIV, and they were completely healed before the doctors could do anything for them. Many signs and wonders are happening all around us. But I want to talk to you about this one. Acts chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. It says, Now Peter and John were going to the temple at the hour of prayer. Going to church is good, and going to prayer meeting is good. Amen? So going to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a man, lame from birth, was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate 
of the temple that is called the beautiful gate to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms, and Peter directed his gaze at him. One of the, one of the incredible parts that we play in somebody receiving healing is that we perceive the need. We pause. The church agenda, your life's agenda, has to pause when you encounter this person. If somebody at work is complaining about their cold, pause and say, can I pray with you about that? And they say, well, not here. Can I pray at home about it? Yes, thank you. Then make sure that you remember. Make a note and remember to pray. Whatever their need is, their child may be in serious trouble. Their, their wife, uh, their husband, they, their friend, their neighbor may, may have incredible needs. Stop and pause and, and say to them, can I pray for you? Can I pray for them? So that when they recover miraculously, they will remember that somebody asked God to meet their need and God did, amen? Amen. So pause. You have to pause. Fix your gaze and your attention on them. Expect, and, and so Peter um, said to him, even though he was receive, wanting to receive something from them, Peter said in verse 6, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him up, or I'm sorry, he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Not praising Peter, not praising John, but praising God, amen? Amen. And all the people that saw him walking, praising God, and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder. I wonder what that is. Remember that from a couple weeks ago? Or maybe last week. I can't remember. But last week, look, God does this incredible miracle, this incredible sign. That doesn't change people's minds, but they stop, they pause, and they're in wonder. I wonder what just happened. They were filled with awe and wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Sometimes our story is not enough. People don't believe us. Sometimes they have to hear it from someone they know that they've known were lame, sick, filled with cancer, had the tumor. They've seen the x-rays. And then when God answers the prayer, It's not just for the person who received the healing, but it's for those who know the person who saw the healing. And they all pause, and they all stop, and they all wonder, what was that? And then we can share with them what we have experienced with God, our story with God. It should be biblical, but it's your story. And then they can receive the ultimate healing, the healing from separation from God, a healing that gives them eternal life and not just life here. So what does it mean in the name of Jesus? What does in the name of Jesus mean? So while the man who uh, was healed clung to Peter and John, um, the people that were uh, around them was, were astounded. In fact, they, they rushed the porch of Sol- the porch called Solomon at the temple. They rushed in. They, you know, there was a mob running in to find out was that excitement. People didn't have to be invited to church. People didn't have to get a mailer in the mail. People didn't have to see the sign out front. But they saw the sign and the wonder of a man they knew was lame. And he was healed. And they come rushing in. Were they saved? No. But they were wondering what was happening. Something happened in the church. Something happened in God's house. Something happened because someone prayed. Something happened because they said in Jesus' name. Something happened and they come rushing in. Do you want that in your church? Amen. Amen. Do you want that in your church? Amen. Amen. We want that in our church, but we must believe in order for that to happen in our church. The world is not better because we have technology. The world can be better because we have Jesus. The world is not better because the medicine is better. The world is better because we can have Jesus. I don't know about you, but the side effects of this medicine is almost worse than the the disease that cures. 
<laughs> Amen, brother. But what if Jesus healed you? What's the side effect from that? What are the side effects? If I could list those today, it may cause temporary awe and wonder among the friends that you know. It, it may cause people to stop their busy day and look at the one who knows Jesus, the one that they know has spent time with the Lord, and to pause and listen. It may result ultimately in some cases of those people becoming followers of Christ themselves who are then filled with the Holy Spirit, who are then going around the world praying with faith for those who need God to meet a need and suddenly there's an epidemic of God's glory in the earth. Amen? Those are the side effects of being healed by God. And guess how much it costs? I don't want to say anything. I don't want to say they cost nothing. Because grace is not cheap. Grace is receiving what you don't deserve. Grace is freely given by our God, but it cost him something. It cost his son upon the cross. Who by his stripes we are healed. In his the atonement that he brought to us through his son, healing is one of the things that happens. Not just healing of our bodies, but healings of healing of our spirit, healing of our soul, healing of our mind. We're made whole. Now we're so still susceptible to the the pests and the thorns and, and some of the diseases, but we can go through it not alone. We, don't, we can go through it with a fewer number of those side effects from modern medicine. We can go through it a little bit better because we have Jesus and we have faith and we call upon his name. So while this man was clinging to him, all these people rushed in. Then Peter told them something. It wasn't just a miracle and then walk on by and say, whew, that blew their minds. I bet you they're going to be talking about that for years. That's not what miracles are for. The miracle was for this. It was to help someone in need because God loves them. This man that was at that gate, God loved. And God wanted to help him. This man didn't even have the faith to be helped. But those who stopped, paused, looked at them, cared and gave them what they had the name of Jesus that faith gave that man access to the divine and the divine healed him this man became a believer and a follower of Christ so then Jesus said this or I'm sorry Peter said this he explained what had happened to them he said men of Israel why do you wonder at this why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power, our piety, we have made him walk? So the first thing is that it is not us. It's not by our power or our piety. It's not by our goodness. It's not by our works. But it's only by the name of Jesus. Amen? So, that's the second point. God glorifies his servant in Jesus. He also told them the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers glorifies his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and you denied. You denied the holy, the righteous one, and you killed him. The author of life, you killed him. How ironic is that? But this is the one who God raised from the dead. It's that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead quickens our mortal bodies. Now, what is that word quicken? Quicken is to move, is to, is to, is to change, is to, is to, is to uh, allow to be alive. You know, if you look at, the, if you look at somebody who has been um, clinically they're in a state where their heart has stopped and they're not breathing anymore and, and they're just completely still, when life enters back into it, now I know their brain is still operating, but when life enters back into them, their body quickens. They react to it. In fact, many times they cannot remain incubated because they'll begin to choke upon it because they're quickened when life comes into The author of life has been risen from the dead and the same spirit that raised him from the dead is the same one that will heal you today and take that dead part, take that weak part, take that thing that's gone to sleep and wake it up in your life, Amen. So the same, if he can raise Jesus from the dead, then he can heal you of your body. 
your, your sores and your illnesses in your body. The next thing is in the name of Jesus, by faith in his name. Not in faith in how well the preachers preach. Not in faith in what just the word of God might say. But faith in the one who gave us the word of God. Faith in God. Faith in God. We call it the word of God because it is his word. So it's faith in the one who sent us the word, not just the words on the page, but the author of the words on the page is going to do something. Now, why am I being so, why am I splitting hairs with that? Why am I being precise? It's because the word of God, the Bible, is not a magical book of incantations. Unfortunately, it's used that way many times. That if I say these words, In this order, then I will receive these promises. And that's not what it is. But it's what the Bible is meant not just to be an operating manual for our lives, a self help book for us. The Bible is meant to bring us into a true relationship with God, the author of the book. It is God's self revelation of Himself in a relationship with us. That's what the Bible is. And so if we're going to have a relationship with him, it needs to go past the pages of the book and stop making it a book of magic incantations, but to make it a book that is a gateway to knowing him personally. It is a gateway, and you should go through that gate. Is it possible to know God in other ways? Yes, partially, but not fully like it is when you go through the gate of the scriptures. And what a protection it is so that we know that we're finding the one true God rather than just anybody's thought of what God might be. So we go through the word of God. And so this one who sent it by faith in his name, what does it mean, his name? Back in the day when Jesus Christ walked the earth, the name was more than just a title on a legal document or what you would call your friend. A name encompasses who you are and what you have done. So when you would say someone's name, what would come to mind is not just that it's a person with a social security number, but it is everything they are and have done. That's the name. That's why my dad told me, he said, yeah, you know, I was kind of a wild kid growing up too. And I, you know, my dad didn't believe in God at the time, neither did my mom. But the one thing he told me was, yeah, I know you're going to be a little wild. I was a little wild, but don't you ever shame the name of shepherd. And any time I got close to shaming the name of shepherd, I paid a heavy price. There's a lot in the name. Even my dad, who was unsaved, knew that when people heard the name of shepherd, that it should mean something more than just a stranger or a neighbor but it's all that he was and all that he did and all of his children, what they are and what they've done. By faith in the name of Jesus Christ, it's all that Christ was, all that Christ did on the cross, in the grave, in the resurrection. As he ascended into heaven and poured out his spirit, as the church filled by a spirit began to go out in his name all of those are encompassed in his name and when we have faith in his name then things begin to happen let's shift from just a magical incantation where we use his name to where we are actually in full belief in full understanding, and full acceptance of who he is, and why would he possibly care enough to touch my body and heal me? Why would he actually care enough to touch the body of my friend and heal them? Take everything that he is, and you will know that you can trust him, you can know that he is able, and you can know that he is willing, and you know that he wants to. And so all that he is, remember how he healed the blind man's eyes. Remember how he healed the lame man. Remember how he cast out that demon. Remember how he cured the person that had palsy. Remember how he cured the woman with fever. Remember how he raised the daughter of Jairus who had been reported dead. Remember how he did that because that's who he is. He is a healer. The Old Testament said that when he is lifted up, when he rises, there will be healing in his wings. Interesting word, wing. Wing in the Greek is called talit. 
And the hem of a garment is called a talit. Because a wing on a bird is like a triangle. And the corner of a garment is like a triangle. And so when the woman came up to him who had an issue of blood for 12 years, no doctors could help her. She walked up to him and all she wanted to do, all she said to herself was, if I could only touch the talit of his garment, I know I will be healed. And as she touched the corner, the talit of his garment, the wing of his garment, and the wing that when it was lifted up, there will be healing in his wings. As she touched the hem of his garment, his virtue, virtue, not, not some cold power, not some electricity, but his very ethics, his ethics, his character, his personality, who he is, God is love, came out of her, out of him, and into her, and she was made whole. Faith that is through Jesus that it is through Jesus Christ gave this man perfect health according to the scriptures. Made whole. I believe we receive what we can bear. Let's become people who can bear more. Let's be people who whose backs are no longer burdened with the proverbial last straw of all the troubles of this life let's shake off that load of hay and load of straw and let's allow our backs to carry the promises of Jesus Christ the gifts of Jesus Christ the hope of Jesus Christ the virtue of Christ let us be those who carry those loads into this world let's shift today you know we don't have to go far do we you know today that you believe in Christ you believe that he is Lord. You believe he's the way, the truth, and the life. You believe in him. So the shift is just a little, a little. Let this be your shift today. I will never fear false hope because my God's perfect love casts out all fear. Therefore, I do not have false hope. Because love of God has cast out fear and now I simply have hope. I have hope, not false hope. Because he is the way, the truth, and the life.